Hello all, welcome back to the BioRox channel. In this video today, we will be learning about Kingdom Monera and we are going to look at specifically the structure of the bacterial cell. Okay, as you can see it on your screen that uh, a bacteria is going to have an outermost uh, covering, which is called as capsule. As you can see here, it's been coated with a green color, little like a yellowish, you can see the capsule. So capsule can also be called as a slime layer. Slime layer. And uh, this capsule is uh, actually the most uh, outermost one, which is lying just out of your cell wall. This green structure that you can see is going to be the cell wall. So outer to your cell wall, you're going to have this particular structure which has been called as capsule and uh, sometimes the capsule can be organized or disorganized we'll see more in details and uh, just into the capsule inner towards we are going to have the second structure which has been called as cell wall as you can see this is your green colored cell wall that you can see here and then comes the light bluish structure that you can see here as a membrane which is enclosing your bacteria is going to be the cytoplasmic membrane, which has been uh, called as plasma membrane usually. And uh, your cytoplasm is comprising of the nucleoid. And uh, this nucleoid is nothing but your prokaryotic uh, DNA, which is going to be double-stranded. We'll be learning about it, which is directly present in the cytoplasm. You can see some granules as of like in group, which are the polysomes, group of ribosomes. You can see some individual uh, ribosomes also present. And we we'll learn about these ribosomes too. And you can see even uh, small uh, hair-like structures which are projecting out here from the slime layer. Actually, they are developing deep from in the cytoplasm. And these are going to be the pili. And the long rip-like structure that you can see here is going to be the flagella, okay? This is the structure of a bacterial cell. Now we will go into the details of this. I'll share my screen with you. Okay. Now, this is a bacterial cell that I have drawn for you all. As you can see, we have seen that the most outermost layer is being called as the slime layer. Slime layer can also be called as a capsule. Okay, or you can even call this layer as an S layer too. Coming on to this capsule, sometimes this may be organized well, or this may be unorganized too. Okay, and if this is going to be well organized, it does not get washed off easily during the straining techniques. Okay. That is the reason we are calling it as capsule, since it does not get washed off. But if this is going to be unorganized, and if this is going to be diffusible, then we should call it as slime layer. If something is getting diffused, it's not well organized, then we should call it as a slime layer. That is your capsule, which has been present. But what is capsule made up of? Capsule is being made up of uh, the components like polysaccharides, which are the complex carbohydrates. They're made up of polysaccharides. And uh, usually the polysaccharides will be helping the bacteria in uh, protecting itself from desiccation. It is providing protection from the desiccation process. It will even protect the bacterial cell from the phagocytosis, phagocytosis by any of the host cells. So it is basically providing protection, the polysaccharides. And uh, secondly, they may be even having some proteins or they may even have the proteins clubbed up with the sugars, which has been called as glycoproteins, okay? And uh, these are not only helping from the desiccation or phagocytosis, 
but also this is go also going to help your bacterial cells from the pH fluctuations. They will be protecting them from the different enzymes in the host body, okay? Or even they will be overcoming the osmotic stress also. So these are the various functions of your capsule and the capsule is the outermost layer. And especially just because of the capsule, your bacteria becomes so stronger that it becomes very, very, very virulent and nothing can actually, maximum nothing cannot actually damage your bacterial cells. Then coming on to the second layer that we should speak about is a cell wall that I have drew here with the red color, that is your cell wall. And uh, usually cell wall is being, uh, everyone knows even in the plant cells that this gives a definite shape. So here also your cell wall is giving a definite shape to the bacteria. And uh, secondly, we can even see that this is going to even provide the protection, second level of protection provided by your cell wall. And uh, the cell wall of the bacteria are being made up of a polymer of peptidoglycan. Peptidoglycan, once again, peptidoprotein, glycan, sugars, peptidoglycans, or you can even call this as murine. So this is a composition of this. And usually you can even see the murines even in the blue-green algae, which is a cyanobacteria also. And uh, remember that uh, your uh, bacteria, usually we are going to classify them into two different types. So we have two different types of bacteria, like we have the gram-positive bacteria, and the other we have is a gram-negative bacteria. So if you look at the gram-positive bacteria, and gram-negative bacteria. I, I think this actually, you need to know that uh, we are going to have a staining technique. There is a staining technique actually. Based on the staining technique, we are classifying the bacteria into gram-positive and the gram-negatives. This was being developed by Mr. Christian Gram, Christian Gram, in the year of 1884. And uh, he used a dye which was being called as crystal violet. And this staining technique is being called as Gram's staining technique. So this is Gram's staining technique. And uh, remember that both of the bacteria, Gram negative and Gram positive are very, very, very different from each other. I'll show you the images. You will come to an idea about that. But remember that the gram-negative bacteria cell wall is very, very, very heterogeneous. Okay, but the cell wall of your gram-positives are homogeneous. What are heterogeneous? Made of several different components, similar components here. And the thickness of the cell wall in the gram-negative, the thickness of the gram-negative bacterial cell wall is, we're talking about the gram negative, this is going to be only and only 10 to 15 nanometers. While here, in the gram positives, the thickness of the cell wall, thickness of the cell wall is going to be about 25 to 30 nanometers. It's a huge difference, right? The compositions and the heterogeneity and the homogeneity here and uh, the other thing that you can see that cell wall is very, very, very thick here. It's very thin there. And usually the gram negative bacteria has some different compositions here because I told you they're heterogeneous. So what are those present here are? They are going to have some peptidoglycans. They are going to have some phospholipids. They are going to have some proteins. They are going to have some lipopolysaccharides. These are this, these, these all are making the gram negative bacterial cell wall to be heterogeneous. Okay. But whereas here coming on to these are homogeneous, they are comprising of 80% of only and only peptidoglycans. Max to max 80% they're having these peptidoglycans and the remaining are present like your phospholipids or the proteins especially they're going to be present in very minute traces. But the basic difference here is 
your gram positive bacteria are going to have a specific composition which is being called as ticoic acid ticoic acid well as here there is no ticoic acid which is making this huge difference is the presence of the ticoic acids and the thickness of the cell wall and just after the staining technique you can see that after even washing with the alcohol still the gram positive stays stained but here there is no stain after washing it with alcohol okay these are the basic differences between the gram positives and the gram negative bacteria and uh, let me like uh, show you after a while the images just give me a moment okay So as you can see it on the screen here, the differences between the gram positives and the gram negative bacteria. Okay, so you can see that your gram positive bacteria cell wall thickness is very high here, around like 25 to 30 nanometers. You can see this on your screen and you can even see the ticoic acids which have been present as long threads here. These are the ticoic acids which are present. While the thickness of the outer cell wall membrane, the peptidoglycan here, which is actually present, is also very thin. How much is that? In the gram negative bacteria, this is only 10 to 15 nanometers. That's it. And there is no ticoic acid present here. That's what is making it big difference between both of them. Now, so we have seen about the different types of bacteria based on the straining techniques, but we were talking about the cell wall. We spoke about the peptidoglycan murines and we came into the straining technique. Now, let me go and uh, introduce you with the flagella. What is a flagella? Flagella is a long whip-like structure which is being present and which is extending out from your plasma membrane. See, from here, the flagellin protein, the three coiled structures. Actually, this flagella is uh, being uh, made up of a structure, uh, made up of a protein. And the protein which is making up your flagellum is going to be flagellin protein. This is extending out piercing from your plasma membrane. And the bacteria's uh, flagellas are going to actually help in swimming in water and that too by the rotation technique they're going to help them in uh, moving from place to the place and uh, based on the presence of the flagella you can classify the bacteria again into different types like we are going to have uh, if a bacteria is going to have only uh, one flagellum a single flagellum then we are going to call this bacteria as monotrichous bacteria, monotrichous. If your bacteria is going to have two number of flagella, then we are going to call this as, yes, what are you going to call this as? This is like two of the flagellas, but it is going to be usually in tuft. What is a tuft? Like your pony, it's a bunch, Okay, if this tuft is being present on either side, so if this is your bacteria, and if the tuft of the flagellum are being present on either sides, then we are going to call it as amphi, let me take the color, amphitrichous bacteria. Okay, and if your bacteria is going to have a tuft of flagellum present on one side, then we are going to call this bacterium as Lophotrichus bacterium. Lophotrichus bacterium. And if at all, a bacteria is going to have multiple flagella on different directions like this, we are going to call such bacteria as 
peritricus bacteria. This is a classification of the bacteria based on the presence of the flagella. If the bacteria do not have any flagellum, we should regard such bacteria as atricus bacteria. Atricus bacteria. Clear? So these are the types of bacteria based on the classification, based on the presence of your flagellum. Now, coming on to, we'll be talking about the plasma membrane now. So as you can see that your plasma membrane, which has been present here, the plasma membrane. So now we are talking about the plasma membrane. So the plasma membrane is actually made of lipids and proteins. So we call it as lipoproteinaceous. This is lipoproteinaceous comprising of 60% of the proteins and 30% of the lipids and only and only 10% of carbohydrates. That's it. And usually your plasma membrane is going to help in maintaining the turgidity. So it is also doing the same function here. And this is also going to help in osmo regulation, regulating the salts, minerals, and fluids, and water across. So that is osmoregulation here. And remember that in gram-positive bacteria, your plasma membrane is folded into such folds like this. Such folds are being called as mesosomes, OK? And these mesosomes are nothing but the infoldings of your plasma membrane, OK? And this is actually going to have respiratory enzymes, respiratory enzymes helping in the cellular respiration process, OK? Next, coming on to the matrix of the cell, the whole matrix inside the cell that we are going to call as cytoplasm. So this is your cytoplasm filling up your bacterial cell here. That is your cytoplasm. And what does a cytoplasm have? Cytoplasm has the organelles like your polysomes, ribosomes, flagellae, and pili, and to that of your this double coil circular DNA, which is being called as plasmid. It is going to have the actual uh, genome, which has been uh, double coiled, the DNA, which has been present, called as a nucleoid, what we are going to call, which is actually regarded as a single chromosome, okay? The single chromosome, chromosome, single chromosome, which is circular and double stranded. But remember children, as in uh, eukaryotes, in order to pack your DNA, we have histones, but since bacteria is a prokaryote and uh, not having such huge DNA, it's only a single chromosome. So the DNA does not have any packing proteins so we say that there are no histone proteins here in your bacteria. This is another important thing. And it's having an, another self-replicating. This is self-replicating. It does not require any enzymes or any information or any rules or anything that has to be passed from the nucleoid to replicate. This is self-replicating. Your plasmid is going to self-replicate, do not require any enzyme or protein factory to be assisted from your nucleoid. It does it by its own. It's a self-replicating plasmid which has been present. And this self-replicating plasmid itself is going to have these, uh, what you call as uh, drug resistive genes which have been present. So we are going to learn about this in the biotechnology. So this is going to be the antibiotic resistant genes that will be developed by the bacteria that are developed inside the plasmid. And what else is being present in the cytoplasm? You're going to have lots and lots of reserve food materials, like um, all the sorts of like the reserve foods that whatever the, your bacteria is going to store up. And it is going to have lots of sugars, the proteins, the lipids, different sorts of ions, and all these things are being present inside the cytoplasm. Okay. And uh, what is a polysome? Polysome is nothing but the group of ribosomes that we are going to have. 
group of ribosomes are going to form the polysomes. Clear? And the ribosomes which are being present here, if this is going to be an individual ribosome, a ribosome of a bacteria, it's a prokaryotic type, right? So they are going to have a 70S ribosome. What is S? S is nothing but Swedberg unit. And this unit speaks about how is the sedimentation rate of a smaller subunit into a larger subunit of your ribosome. So it is sedimenting inside and that sedimentation is being uh, actually measured by the Swedberg units. And so we call it a 70S ribosome. So what is 70S? The smaller subunit being 30S and the larger subunit being 50S. Okay, that is your prokaryotic ribosome. There are no membranous bounded organelles like mitochondria, chloroplasts, Golgi's, endoplasmic reticulums, all these are absent. But remember that in the photosynthetic bacteria, they are going to possess chromatophores inside the cytoplasm. And what are the reserve foods of your bacteria that are found in the cytoplasm? The reserve food of the bacteria is going to be mostly in the form of glycogen, which is poly, that is beta hydroxybutyrate. Poly beta hydroxybutyrate. This is the reserve food material that is in form of glycogen inside the cytoplasm. So we have learned about the structure of the bacteria, which is comprising of a capsule, then a cell wall, and then comes a plasma membrane in, inside which it has been filled up with the cytoplasm with a nucleoid, the main single chromosome DNA, double coiled DNA. And the next comes is a plasmid, which is going to be a self-replicating body, which has been present. And plasmid is going to actually develop the antibody resistive genes also. And uh, secondly, we have learned about the movement structures developed here called as flagella. And uh, besides flagella, we are also going to have some pili. What are these pili? The small structures which have been present are the pili. And usually pili are the ones which are going to actually attach the bacteria to a solid structure. Okay, it's for the attachment to the solid surface. And uh, usually a uh, few of these uh, pili are also being called as fimbria that you will see later. But just remember that your pili are also going to help in conjugation process or binding two bacterial cells in exchanging the genetic material in the conjugation also, the pili are going to help. So they are helping in attachment uh, to a solid surface and the pili are also going to help in the conjugation process. So this is about the structure of a bacterial cell, which is a prokaryote. I hope you have understood about how we are div um, dividing uh, the bacteria into gram positive, gram negative on the sort of like cell wall and the ticoic acids and how we are classifying the bacteria based on these uh, sort of like the presence of the flagella. And remember children, not only the based on the flagella, but also based on the uh, types of uh, shapes of the bacteria also, we will be classifying the bacteria into different types. Like if you're going to have a single spherical bacteria or sometimes if they are occurring in a pair like this, or if they are going to have a long chain of spherical bacteria, what do we they call them as? Or sometimes we can even have uh, the circular bacteria like they are going to be eight of them like this forming a cube like structure and uh, sometimes you can even see that uh, there is a group of uh, many of the circular bacteria but there is no specific shape for it they are so irregularly arranged so what do we call them as we even classify them like this and the bacteria which are going to be spherical and single then we are going to call it as monococci or coccus bacteria and if they're going to be in Two in pair, we call them as a diplococcus bacteria. And if they're going to be in a long chain like this, we are going to call them as streptococcus bacteria. And if they're in eight as a cube, we should call them as sarcina bacteria. And if they are irregularly arranged like this, all the cocci, then we should call them as stephylo. 
stepylococci bacteria. These are the different shapes of the circular ones. Besides that, we are going to have rod shaped like structures which are being called as bacillus bacteria. And same again, you can classify them into the monobacillus, diplosa, and uh, strepto, and sarcina, staphylobacillus, and all based on their arrangements. And then we have the vibrio bacteria. Usually they are going to be twisted like this or a karma shape. Usually like a karma, they're going to be the vibrio. And they usually possess a flagella on either side like we have seen earlier talking about the flagella so that if they're going to have together on either sides, we're calling this amphitrichus. So it's like this or sometimes you can even have something like this uh, corkscrew or helically coiled bacteria, which is being called as a spirillum bacteria. So we are classifying the bacteria based on the shapes, based on the presence of the flagella and all. I hope you all children have understood uh, regarding the bacteria which is belonging to the Monera kingdom. And uh, uh, if you like this video, please uh, like the button, press the like button and try to share this with your friends and uh, try to subscribe my channel. Thank you all. I hope you all have understood this.